A new report claims to expose Rotten Tomatoes, and I've got my thoughts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Merle here with my thoughts on a news story that broke earlier this week. You've probably seen some form of it. It's being sensationalized in many corners as this expose of the Hollywood critics, of all Hollywood critics, and this pay to play system. The word woke is usually thrown in there because, you know, clicks. And that's not exactly what I take away from it. And I've been talking about Rotten Tomatoes specifically on this channel, on my previous channel, before I started my own channel here, for many, many years. So I wanted to break down what the story says, what it says about critics, and specifically what it says about Rotten Tomatoes. The story is called The Decomposition of Rotten Tomatoes. The most overrated metric in movies is erratic, reductive, and easily hacked, and yet has Hollywood in its grip. And the real headline maker was some reporting that was done around a very small movie called Ophelia, which is a retelling of Hamlet from the point of view of the character Ophelia. The movie starred Daisy Ridley and Naomi Watts. It premiered at Sundance in early 2018, but did not secure distribution until a year later in early 2019. In the year between its Sundance premiere and when it got picked up for distribution, Ophelia was sitting for a while on Rotten Tomatoes, according to Vulture, with a tomato meter rating of 46%, meaning out of the 13 movie reviews, seven of them were negative, and that's not a good look for a movie that is trying to secure distribution and attract buyers. At some point in this process, Ophelia took on a PR firm, or public relations firm, called Bunker 15, which is an upstart in the industry, and it handled mostly small indie films, stuff that you'd see on VOD. In a 2019 blog post from Bunker 15 on the website The Film Collaborative, the company explains their strategy, which is that it finds and catalogs critics who watch and review indie and VOD films, and reaches out to them directly in order to get reviews for movies that their company is representing. And that's not unusual in and of itself. I get probably 30 marketing emails a day for from different PR firms that want to offer an interview with a director or an actor involved in a movie or offer a screening link or an actual screening. And a lot of those movies are movies like Ophelia. They're very small films. They're going to be in a small theater count or straight to VOD. And they have PR firms that they hire in order to solicit critics to watch and review the movies. This is just how the business works. In fall of 2018, several months after Ophelia debuted at the Sundance Film Festival, Bunker 15 began reaching out to critics on behalf of the film, telling them, quote, it's a Sundance film and the feeling is that it's been treated a bit harshly by some critics. I'm sure sky high expectations were the culprit. So the teams involved feel like it would benefit from more input from different critics. That is a bit manipulative, but again, not exactly over the line for a PR firm that is representing a client, perhaps a little bit more forward than you might see. The lines really began to be crossed in other emails that went out to critics. According to one critic, they were told from a Bunker 15 representative that, quote, super nice critics who didn't like the movie would write up a negative review on a blog different from the one that was listed on Rotten Tomatoes. So they could still write a bad review, but it would not appear on the outlet where where Rotten Tomatoes would see it and list it on the website. So essentially, if you don't like the film, you can write a bad review, just hide it away from the website. That is a real blurring of the line. Even worse was another critic who said that after they reviewed Ophelia negatively, another representative from Bunker 15 reached out to them directly and asked them to, quote, give it a barely overall positive review. I do know the editors at Rotten Tomatoes and can get it switched. So basically soliciting the critic to rewrite their review from Rotten to Fresh, which they would then send to Rotten Tomatoes and have it switched out for the already published Rotten Review. That is super shady. And finally, I think the most damning allegation in Vulture's story is that the critics who reviewed Ophelia, some of them at least, were paid reportedly $50 by Bunker 15 to review the film. Now, the story doesn't necessarily state that a positive review was required in order to take the payment, but it actually doesn't matter because ethically, as a critic, you do not take money from a studio or anyone representing a studio or a movie in order order for a review. Critics are paid, but they are paid by outlets or they're paid by ads for people that read what they do or watch what they do. The ethics on this are very clear. It is extremely unethical to take a payout from a studio or a movie to review that movie, good or bad, and it's also unethical on the part of Bunker 15 to offer payments or facilitate payments for reviews. That is a black and white issue. Bunker 15's campaign netted Ophelia 
reportedly eight reviews between October of 2018 and January of 2019, which pushed the movie into fresh territory on Rotten Tomatoes. And in February of 2019, the film did indeed secure distribution from IFC Films. Ophelia was quietly released in June 2019 in just over 50 theaters domestically, where it put up unremarkable numbers, about $50,000 domestically, a worldwide gross around $350,000. And it's the kind of movie, quite honestly, that never would have been thought of or remembered again, except for a select few, if it were not for this story coming up years later. In response to the story, the founder of Bunker 15, Daniel Harlow, said that Vulture was, quote, stretching, and also that, quote, we have thousands of writers on our distribution list. A small handful have set up a specific system where filmmakers can sponsor or pay to have them review a film. Which seems to abdicate responsibility for direct payments for the reviews, despite what other critics claim to Vulture, but doesn't really address at all the fact that representatives of the company allegedly reached out to critics and told them to either hide bad reviews or change bad reviews into good reviews. Again, that completely crosses the line from just being a marketing or a PR firm looking out for your client to unethical behavior, and they don't really refute that at all in this statement to Vulture. For its part, Rotten Tomatoes said in a statement, quote, We take the integrity of our scores seriously and do not tolerate any attempts to manipulate them. We have a dedicated team who monitors our platforms regularly and thoroughly investigates and resolves any suspicious activity. Rotten Tomatoes has also removed the movie Ophelia from its site entirely, along with reportedly either reviews for films that were represented by Bunker 15 or the other films that Bunker 15 represented completely. And personally, I think that's also a bad move because Rotten Tomatoes, the site itself, was not really implicated in all of this. I understand the desire to just wipe the movie off the site in hopes that the story kind of goes away, but that's not going to happen. And it kind of makes Rotten Tomatoes look guilty when apparently there's no guilt for Rotten Tomatoes anywhere in the story. Regarding anything around paid reviews or direct interference from a PR firm or a studio to critics as far as changing reviews from rotten to fresh, Ophelia is the only movie that the Vulture story covers. This is far from the mind-blowing expose of Hollywood film criticism that so many channels have spun this story out to be. You would think, looking at those channels, that Disney got caught slipping $10,000 to the New York Times under the table for a positive review of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and that's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about one small movie, a handful of critics, perhaps 10 or fewer, but that's just how the YouTube ecosystem works right now. The channels that sensationalize things, that put those clickbait titles, and they throw in the words like woke, and they make it seem like every critic is now dirty, and that the secret has been exposed, those videos will have a reach, I promise you, of 5 to 10 times what this video will, because that's just how the system works right now, and it kind of ties into the overall Rotten Tomatoes system, which tends to get rid of the mediums and only highlight extreme good and extreme bad. And there's a difference between this specific movie and how it dealt with Rotten Tomatoes and the overall system of Rotten Tomatoes in general. A big chunk of the Vulture article moves on from the Ophelia story to critique the Rotten Tomatoes system itself and the idea that the tomato meter skews critical opinion, that you only see how many critics liked or disliked a movie, it doesn't show you how much the critics liked it or how much they didn't like it, and that's something I've been talking about on this channel for literally years. I talked about it on Screen Junkies when I was at Screen Junkies. I have a segment on this channel called Rotten Tomatoes Decoded that is expressly dedicated to looking at the critics' average rating, which I think is much more representative of critical opinion than the fresh rotten tomato meter. So this criticism is nothing new, but added to the Ophelia story, it helped to kind of juice up the story a bit more and give it an aim, which was very much that the rotten tomato system is being manipulated by studios and perhaps even critics themselves. Although I think that some of those conclusions are on pretty shaky ground. Rotten Tomatoes in general has been denounced by filmmakers for a very long time, including people like Martin Scorsese. And even when you go back to Cisco and Ebert, my favorite critic of all time is Roger Ebert. And I watched Siskel and Ebert growing up. It was such an important show to me. But the thumbs up, thumbs down binary rating system was called the death of film criticism by people decades ago before Rotten Tomatoes and its version of the same system even hit the landscape. Vulture also goes into how studios can manipulate the existing Rotten Tomatoes system by inviting critics to early screenings of a film who they believe are more likely to give their movie a positive 
negative review, thus inflating potentially the movie's scores early on in order to get good publicity and help sell tickets. And then we'll later invite other critics who will perhaps be more critical of the film, which will bring the Rotten Tomatoes score down. But after that initial round of good press and the first reaction critic scores are very high, etc. And again, this is something that I've covered on this channel, specifically with Wonder Woman 1984. Early reviews put it at certified fresh. Once more critics saw it, it went all the way down to rotten. And the idea of selecting specific critics for a first screening isn't a new practice either. Is it manipulative of the system? Well, absolutely, I think it is. But I don't think it's corrupt or immoral in any way. It's just a studio trying to protect its investment. I personally find it annoying as a critic because I think as a studio, if you think that you've made a good movie, then you should put it up to the test from the first day and invite as many critics as you want to see it because usually the truth ends up out there anyway. When you look at Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, the Vulture story talks about how early reviews for that film were much more positive than later reviews, which is true, but the truth about that movie eventually got out there. Maybe the opening weekend was inflated a little bit by those early reviews, but Quantumania came crashing down to earth in the second weekend and it's not like those early mega reviews made a box office mega hit out of a movie that would have flopped otherwise Ant-Man and the Lost Quantumania was a box office disappointment largely because once the movie actually came out more critics saw it and gave it more negative reviews and audiences saw it and decided for themselves so Vulture broke some real news with the Ophelia thing. They covered some kind of well-worn ground with their criticism of the Rotten Tomatoes system and how studios can manipulate that system. But then they got into some very dicey territory and stuff that really kind of pissed me off a little bit when they got into the expansion of the Rotten Tomatoes roster. Because about five years ago, Rotten Tomatoes invited a lot more critics to participate on the website, they added about a thousand critics to their roster. Most of those critics were from smaller sites, a lot of people who write for their own blogs and also from a lot of online outlets. And in the interest of full disclosure, I was one of the critics who got approved to be on Rotten Tomatoes when they expanded it, especially to include online media. Rotten Tomatoes said those changes were largely to help diversify the critic pool on the site, noting that half of the new critics were women, one-fourth of the group were people of color, and 66% of these critics have come from underrepresented groups, including LGBTQ plus critics and those with disabilities. However, lacking any evidence whatsoever, Vulture went on to speculate that the expansion of the Rotten Tomatoes roster didn't really have anything to do with diversity, but was instead a ploy by the company to boost the scores of Hollywood blockbusters and enhance their box office prospects because so many big movies like Baywatch at the time were not getting good critical reviews. At the same time, it also carried complaints from an unnamed indie director's publicist that the director's last film had gotten great reviews from the, quote, highbrow critics, but that the scores were low from the newer critics in a case where the score was low because the movie, quote, may not appeal to the whole gamut of Rotten Tomato reviewers, which to me makes it sound like they're pretty much calling the new reviewers lowbrow. As an online critic, this rhetoric actually infuriates me because this is the kind of elitist condescension that online critics have been facing since we really started to emerge as a major voice in film criticism. The established largely print media has been on a crusade for many, many years to paint all online critics as uninformed plebeian cinematic normies that are ready to lick any boot or rubber stamp any blockbuster movie that's put in front of us in exchange for an interview with the stars or a ticket to a premiere. I have been part of the critical world for a long time. I've been a part of many circles with many critics, both online and from what you would call the more traditional outlets. And I can tell you, having witnessed it with my own eyes, that there are just as many people from the quote, more enlightened world of the legacy and broadcast critical community who yes, are in this business for the perks. And I'm not saying that these critics don't exist. However, I think it is a very small number of critics. From my experience, it is a very small number of critics. They are very easy to spot and they're an embarrassment. It is from my experience, a fraction of the industry and Vulture's lone piece of supporting evidence for this assertion was to cite a study from Canada's Global News. 
The study found that the overall tomato meter score for wide releases ticked up between 2016 and 2021, which is true, and Vulture used that to imply that it was because of the expanded Rotten Tomatoes roster. The basic theory is that the new critics, as Vulture had presupposed, were giving wide releases better critical scores because they'd been added to Rotten Tomatoes and were being less critical of studio films on purpose. But I went and looked at that study, and it also found that the scores from Metacritic and IMDb both fluctuated at all almost the exact same pattern over the same time period. When you look at this chart for a long time, Metacritic scores were actually higher than Rotten Tomatoes by a pretty substantial margin. And yes, there is a point at which Rotten Tomatoes scores do increase to become higher than what you see on Metacritic, but that escalation happens before the expansion of Rotten Tomatoes, which began around 2018. Since then, yes, Rotten Tomatoes scores have generally been a few points higher than Metacritic, about five to seven points higher on average, but as you can see, the pattern of those scores doesn't change. When Metacritic dips, Rotten Tomatoes dips. When Rotten Tomatoes spikes, Metacritic spikes. What this chart really shows me is that yes, overall Rotten Tomatoes critics may be slightly more positive on most wide releases, but not to a degree that defies any other pattern. And when you think about what Rotten Tomatoes is now, which is a synthesis of different types of critics, it's really not that surprising that it is slightly higher. It looks to me like Vulture was cherry picking data specifically to make Rotten Tomatoes critics look bad to back up the opinion that they obviously already had coming into writing the article, but ignored contradictory data that would have watered down their conclusion. And if the online world is as amateurish and bought off as the article claims that it is, then why am I the one pointing this out? Why weren't the editors at Vulture, the people whose job it is to look at stories like this and actually decide if they are actually accurate, why weren't they the ones that pointed this out? It really brings to the forefront the question of who really has the agenda here? Is it the Rotten Tomatoes critics that Vulture is seeking to discredit? Or is it maybe Vulture, an arm of a legacy publication, and yet another in a series of articles that have been written over the years looking to discredit people that aren't part of the big arm of traditional media? Am I saying that every critic is perfect? No, and this story is proof of that. But if you look at the majority of critics out there, and I will include myself in this group, we are people who honestly and sincerely want to share our love of movies and our opinions of movies to an audience that is increasingly hostile and questioning what the point of what we do even is. Look at how many people were anxious to jump on this story and call us shills. Basically, the acts of a very small number of quote-unquote critics who, if they take this payoff, I don't even count them as part of my profession, are being used to delegitimize the actions of an entire industry. And Vulture didn't really do much in the story to dissuade people from that notion. And it's really unfair. The expansion of Rotten Tomatoes has actually made it possible for more critics to make a living as a movie critic than ever before because there are marketing and PR firms that won't even consider you, and I can speak from experience here, to be allowed access to any sort of screening or to see movies for awards consideration if you are not able to post your review to Rotten Tomatoes. It has become the industry standard far more than it's become the critical standard, and the fact that so many more people now have access to the site has widened the critical circle, and what was once a very small club of elites who who had journalism degrees from Northwestern or wherever, are now competing with people who maybe don't have the same degree, but have the passion and the enthusiasm, and yes, the knowledge of the film world, to be in there with them every day, in the screenings, at the junkets, competing for those stories, competing for that airtime with the celebrities. And quite frankly, I think that a lot of the established journalists resent that and want to discredit online journalists and critics as much as they can. The Vulture piece had a seed of legitimacy in criticizing rightfully the critics who took a payoff, it seems like, for Ophelia, but they then extrapolated that unfairly to an entire group of people. For the critics who were actually exposed, the very few critics seemingly taking money for a positive review of Ophelia, then I think that they should be, if it can be proven that they took that money, banned from Rotten Tomatoes immediately. And honestly, if I were a small indie producer or a production company, I would rethink working with Bunker 15 as my PR firm because they're obviously not too uncomfortable with crossing ethical lines when it comes to promoting their films. 
The rest of the Vulture article was pretty much a rehash of past criticisms of Rotten Tomatoes that many people, including myself, have been making for years, along with, I think, some pretty irresponsible speculation about the newer members to the site with little to no supporting evidence and what evidence they had, I think, could easily be refuted. It was an interesting read, but certainly not the blockbuster takedown of the critical community that people have advertised it as. Is Rotten Tomatoes a corrupt system? No, I don't think it is. I think it's a system that is easily misunderstood by people, and I don't think that the company takes any steps whatsoever to clear up that misunderstanding. And I also think that it's a system that is easily manipulated by the studios, and I think the studios do manipulate that system. But I think that for a very long time, critics have been asked to pay the price for a deeply flawed system when it comes to Rotten Tomatoes. And I don't think that that is fair at all. I'm not saying that critics are perfect or that they are above reproach or criticism themselves. And if somebody sees an activity or an action taken by a critic that they think is provably an example of them taking a benefit that they shouldn't, if they're not being upfront and honest about their relationship with the studio, then they should be called out. Because I can promise you that if it is shown and proven that a critic has done these things, the first people to call that critic out will be other critics because the majority of us are here because we love what we do and we love movies and we want to share that with others. It may not be the most important job in the world. It may not be the most consequential job in the world, but it's certainly what I love to do and I derive joy from it every single day. I thank my lucky stars every single day that I get to do this for a living and I will defend this industry when and where I see fit. This vulture story did a good thing in exposing this specific practice, but I think it discredited itself and the publication by devolving into the same lazy indictments of online critics that we've heard and seen so many times before. And I just wish for once that there would be a big publication like this that supported and defended online critics as much as they claim to support and defend the art of film criticism itself. So those are my thoughts on the Vulture story and the Rotten Tomatoes allegations. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, please stay tuned right here on the channel for more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Thanks for spending part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.